third and final presentation of the day, Municipal Law Enforcement. We've got Captain Dan Bauman from the City of Waukesha Police Department here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So I'm like your third speaker, so you guys are like, your asses are sore. Sorry about that already. I apologize if I swear. Uh, I'll try if I walk around with a mask, or if I walk around, I'll put my mask on because I don't want anybody to get in trouble here because uh, I like to walk around a lot. Um, but yeah, so you guys had the state patrol, so they talked to you about the highways and drunk driving and traffic stops, right? And then you had the fish police, the DNR. Uh, here before. They're the most powerful people in the state. Don't let them uh, fool you because they are. They can do things with and without a warrant that we would have to apply for a warrant for. So they are very powerful. Hence why I kept my mouth shut. I usually would make fun of another agency, especially the state patrol or the DNR. This one I kind of kept quiet uh, because he could hear what I was saying about them. So, you know, these don't muffle it even though they can watch your lips. So we're going to talk about municipal law enforcement. I love coming to these uh, career days ask a question, stump a cop, whatever you got. Uh, that's why we're here for is to best educate you. I can tell you uh, I've been at Waukesha for 21 years now and I never had an opportunity like this. They didn't have, they had college back then, I'm not that old, um, but they had not, there was no mentorship programs back then. There was, um, they maybe a couple agencies had explorers that you could get into know it. I had my uncle and my dad were in law enforcement. So I was enjoyed the riches of their connections in order to get into this career. As you can see by my fancy PowerPoint here, no, there won't be a PowerPoint. Um, so I really didn't have much besides family members telling me what I needed to or not to do to get into this. So this is an awesome opportunity. You get live one-on-one, -on -one, unfiltered access to anything you wanna know uh, about me. Uh, there may be a limit uh, depending on what the question is, but I won't get embarrassed. If you have any questions at any time, just raise your hand and interrupt me and I will answer that question. About law enforcement, go ahead. Why did your dispatcher tell your officers how to respond? Like why is that Oh, you're listening to scanner for the city of Waukesha. You dispatch for the county. Oh, uh, we're taking applications. If I have Becker's here, <laughs> stay on topic. No one will be dispatchers. All right, um, we'll we'll talk offline about that. Um, so the uh, where was I before you stumped me? Oh, if you have any questions about anything, just ask. Especially if it's about law enforcement. Um, just ask us and, and we'll get it to you. You kind of got a good, good feeling of the other two um, agencies out there. I'll tone it down now because I am mic'd up. Uh, as one of my jobs at the Waukesha Police Department is we got a new chief in May and he switched us captains around. So I was in the detective bureau for the last about five and a half years. And now I just got moved to the um, patrol division. So my job now is the patrol civil disturbance unit SWAT team our deployable technology. We're trying to start a canine unit um, and all the little honor guard, you name all the little ancillary tasks that we do um, around the city and for our partners in this region, um, we're, that falls under me now. In the Bureau, that's probably one of my most, uh, I love that position, uh, coming from patrol for a significant amount of time as a patrol officer, sergeant, lieutenant. And then uh, when I got transferred to the Bureau as a captain, it was one of my most amazing experiences. Um, thing that we are, we are part of, we're the only city municipality in Waukesha County. We're one of 37, I believe, uh, Milwaukee County. Uh, enjoy, uh, allowed us to join their mate team, which is the Milwaukee Air Investigative Team. So any in custody, death, or officer involved shooting, any time where force is utilized and someone's likely to die, state statute 175 says that we have to have an outside agency do that. Kind of started, ironically, if you think about it, that statute started by a guy by the name of Michael Bell. Michael Bell was shot and killed in 2000 and don't fact check me, four or five in Kenosha by the Kenosha Police Department, and he died. He reached for an officer's gun, another officer saw that. I won't get into the details of that because it's a he said, she said type of thing. Anyways, law enforcement utilized force, somebody died in their custody. Therefore, Michael Bell's father um, really pushed legislation to have an outside agency. And guess what, law enforcement, do you think law enforcement was for or against that? Against it? Show of hands. You can, we're going to embarrass everybody. Who's against that? Okay. Law enforcement was actually for it. There was some things. The, 
against it, they wanted to do a civ civilian uh, review panel, which is a no-go. I would never go in and tell my cardiologist how to do an open heart surgery, because um, it's just stupid, right? We have no institutional, I know the heart, when it opened up, it looks red and it goes up and down, and sometimes it contracts. That's probably my knowledge that I have of heart. So I would never go in and tell my cardiologist how, cardiologist how to do a job, much like a civilian review that would probably watch Cops or Roadhouse when they're in high school while they're smoking dope in their parents' basement, eating Doritos, or whatever it may be is going to go up on a civilian review board and tell me how I applied force if it was uh, the right amount of force or not. Actually law enforcement was in favor of where it's at, where the law is at right now because it does increase transparency and it does increase uh, oversight because an outside agency and the involved agency actually is a little bit of relief because there's a lot of stuff that goes on in these investigations. It's extremely comprehensive investigation and um, it allows uh, the outside agency to come kind of take a lot of that burden off of the involved agency so we started that in Waukesha uh, and with the city of Milwaukee and all the Milwaukee County agencies that by far was one of the best jobs I've had being able to go into another suburb uh, of the city of Milwaukee or in the city of Milwaukee and investigate those incidents it's very rewarding it's neat seeing how there's 156 investigators part of the team Waukesha's there's six lead agency Waukesha is one of the lead agencies next to Milwaukee, uh, Greenfield, Oak Creek, Wauwatosa, and West Dallas. And to come together as like the, the lead agency meetings to see there's usually uh, a captain and a lieutenant that are from a representative from each, each one of those six agencies to come together and to see how these uh, investigations uh, unfold was probably one of the most rewarding parts of it. Um, why am I sharing this? Why you just think, okay, Bauman's just up here bragging about himself, telling how great he was. No, I, I got more stuff to break. No, just kidding. I got other stuff to talk about if we wanted to do that. But my job, or my, one of my goals here is so you guys can pick the right agency. Uh, if you guys are, let's say, everybody's dead set on some career in public service. That's why we're here, right? Okay. And, and I'm granted, there's, let's, I don't know how many are in this class right now? 40. 40? Okay. Let's just say 20 of you is 50% actually go into law enforcement, which is great. You know, it's, it's a, right now it's a noble damn profession because I didn't have to deal with what you guys are. Everybody has one of these and everyone's got one of these. And these record and these can say whatever you want without question, without being vetted and verified, no fact checking allowed. You can type on here, Bauman's a douchebag, I hate him so much, he needs to go back to Waukesha, he's a punk, right? And you can hit send on that Twitter thing or the Facebook or Insta Instagram and whatever you wanna do with zero ramifications, right? Because it's what, free speech and you can hide behind this. How many people can hide behind this, right? And I'm not going to be in to get political and say the fake news, or I'm not going to get into the telephone tough guy. Actually, I'm going to get into the telephone tough guy. Is these critics out there have zero knowledge of what we do for a daily event. And you're going into that, going into it now. It took 20 years, 15-ish, for me to be exposed to that. I always knew that people would take a different side of the story. People rush to judgment. People know the Monday morning quarterback, they're gonna tell you everything that they know better than you did at the time of the scene and they weren't even there. But clearly they're the expert. We have millions of experts now that have never sat in our seat, never even took a course on criminal justice, never even watched besides live PD or cops or something, or watched, uh, what's one, of, not Men in Black, what's one of those? The, with Martin Lawrence and uh, Bad Boys, thank you. There's like six of them or something like that? Three? Oh, see, look how much I know. My 13 year old just told me, Dad, I watched the whole Bad Boys. I'm like, does Mom know about that? He's like, yeah, okay. Tone it down a little bit, but uh, there's probably a lot of F bombs in there for a 13 year old. Have you seen all three of them? Do you have? Is it a little rough? Am I a bad dad for not doing more oversight on the Netflix? I should have watched it. Movie night? Okay. So that's what Netflix and chilling really means? No? All right. All right. I won't go there. Don't worry about it. We're good. Um, so we're waiting. So that you guys are coming into a profession now knowing what's out there, what you guys are stepping into. Is that something you really want to expose yourself to? We can just go look at Kenosha. We can look at Milwaukee just as two very high, high profile local incidents. And you can go elsewhere, Atlanta, Missouri, Portland, you name it, where there's a lot of things that by doing what we were trained to do, who's over the age of 21? 
25. 62. Okay, good. I just threw that out there because I didn't want to play again. Not many people are over the age of 25. So you guys walking in, let's, is, and are you guys all seniors here? Like, so you're going to be leaving, you're going to be leaving this course? No? You got a couple more years of schooling? Okay. So let's, let's just say 24. You guys are done with your schooling. You've gone through the academy or you're trying to get hired by a department that's going to sponsor you and put you through the academy. And now you're, you're brand new. You come in there. You don't look like me because I'm more of an admin guy. You actually look like a, a, a grown man or a woman and you get to wear the vest. Go ahead. Does your department sponsor for the academy? Yes. We were the only ones for a long time. And then people were kept going, why City Walk should I get all the good candidates? It's because we, we, our guys are in the academy. Our guys are doing the, this criminal justice program. Our, some of your instructors are from the City of Waukesha. The Recruit Academy is a lot of Waukesha instructors, so we can kind of pick and choose. Um, we see you guys as you grow through the years, plus a lot of people talk. So um, I'm not saying kiss their butts while you're in the academy or while you're in school, but that's a great time for you to be exposed to some of your instructors who have a lot of the hiring uh, influence, if you will, at their local um, law enforcement communities. So I got to do one thing. If you guys raise your hand, I'm going to forget, get off track right away. So where was I? You, you're, my, you're my spot checker. You're my handler today. Okay. Where was I? I'm already failing you. You're already failing me? Going into the profession. Oh, 20 some years old. There we go. 20, 25. 22, 25 years old. We'll say 25. 25 years old, you come into the job, right? And you sit down. You go through the how many weeks of the academy, by us, it's a week, of, uh, a month of day shift, a month of early shift, a month of late shift, and then two weeks of shadow period, some more, tr some more onboarding training. So give it another four months, and then you guys are now on the road by yourself. You get your fancy car, put your fancy glasses on, get your soda pop, hopefully not too much soda, maybe a water or a Powerade or something like that. Because uh, you're health conscious, you don't want to get fat and ugly and stupid or anything like that. Save that when you're in your 50s and 60s, right? I'm not looking directly at you, you just decided to laugh. Okay, so you get in your car and you go out there and your first call is a mental illness, someone suffering from mental illness. How old are you again? 22. What did we say? We're going with 24. 24. 24, there we got somebody listening. You're 24 years old. How many people here are psychiatrists? Social workers? therapists knew somebody that was suffering from mental illness dealt with somebody in crisis and you're 24 years old and now society says guess what ladies and gentlemen I'm gonna I don't want to move too much because like, the swivel is gonna break so I'll, I'll, I'll try to stand in right here all right 24 years old and you guys get sent to somebody suffering from mental illness somebody suffering from homelessness and at 24 years old, you're supposed to have all the tools, all the training, and every ounce of answers out there to say, solve the problems. How many think you guys can do that? I shouldn't see one hand up. I'm only really putting put my hand up is just, I just wanted to see if you guys would just follow me. That's it. Because guess what? At 44 years old, 21 years on the job, I don't have all the answers. But like the DNR said, I can talk. I can talk to anybody. Even when they're MFing you, even when they're spitting and yelling and screaming, you can still have dialogue with somebody. You can still try to de-escalate a situation. And all those techniques you'll learn. But this thing right here, I'll grab some hand sanitizer. This thing right here expects you guys all to be the, psycho the clinical psychologist, not a social worker, not a therapist, a clinical PhD level psychologist expects you to know someone's mental, mental health history, their medical history, and if, how they grew up. That's what society is asking of us nowadays. Are you guys up for that challenge? It's the most noble profession out in the world. Most noble profession, hands down. I love teachers. I like the doctors they keep us alive. I like the bankers they get, make us money if you invest it. We'll get into investing and make sure I don't forget about investing. That'll be like the last five or... We go to 1245, maybe like 1240, right? Make sure you're my handler. You better not forget it, all right? Just a little bit of financial, just a plug, all right? Is that's what's expected of you guys. Are you guys ready to get into this most noble profession? Firefighters, they'll love you. Dispatchers, we can talk about you, but we can't talk without you. 
Name one. Name another noble profession where you see somebody in their most intimate moment, and not sexually intimate, don't let your minds run away, the most intimate moment in their life. 87-year-old Nana dead in the tub. They're not going to prepare you. That's not going to prepare you for. There's no academy for that. You're going to see somebody that's crying weeply that just got beat by their husband of 15 years. Put a gun to someone's head. Somebody that committed suicide. Somebody died by suicide, I should say. You're going to see things that you have. And I'll quote Brad Shaneman from the, from the Sheriff's Department. He's retired now. His dog, he had two dogs, Braun and Soldier. Soldier saved my life one time. Guy pulled a gun on me, and I was coming through some bushes. I came out of the bushes, and there's a guy with a rifle. And holy shit, I said, Shoo, get your dog going. And before I, he even he saw it, before I did, Soldier out there broke the dude's arm. It was awesome, 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 awesome story. Ironically, oh, I'm going to digress a little bit. My daughter was in, a, she was like in fifth grade or something like that. Um, and she's just like, Daddy, this, uh, this guy, Officer Shu, came into school, and he's talking about a story, and he mentioned your name. Did you do I'm like, yeah, that was me. He's, ah. I'm fine, right? But, I mean, is Brad Shaneman once in his retirement speech said, being a police officer or deputy, being in law enforcement, you have the front row seat to the biggest, greatest show in the world. You will never find another show like it. Broadway can't produce it. Hollywood can't promote it. You have the number one seat, the number one show, free ticket to the greatest show in the world. Are you guys ready for something like that? And I, I'm not here to talk you out of it. Not at all. We are looking, when I started, when I went, did my first application process in 1999-ish, time frame, 98, 99-ish, there's 400 people that would have applied at the city of Waukesha. It was like 404. They took four people off the list. Last week, what was the 22nd? Was the 22nd last weekend? Two weekends ago? It was a Saturday, whatever. Fact check me or not. Whatever it was, a couple, the 20th. It's a Saturday, whatever Saturday was in August. We had 90 people apply by us. Only like 63 actually completed the application process correctly and showed up. We really dumbed down our application process. Name, middle initial, date of birth, last name, some basic information. Some people didn't even fill that out correctly or they just did not show up to the physical. The physical, we about, I think that got knocked down to 53 and then another 12 failed on the written, and the written portion of the exam. The, for if you guys do a standard and associates, it's a nationwide company. It's a, there's not, I don't know what you can do to, and I, it was weird because I got the results and it was all math, I, I believe. Did anybody do our application? I probably should ask that first. If, and then if you did it and you failed, don't raise your hand because I, I don't, I don't want to embarrass you. But. So you got a national standard test to come in there um, to get hired by us. There's not, you guys, there's not a lot of education and um, and recruiting out there. Do we have a recruiting team? My point being is that there's such a small, small window of people that want to go into law enforcement right now. Make sure it's for the right reason. Make sure it is because you want to serve. Make sure it's because you want to, you have that gut feeling, you, you've always wanted to be it, it's the noble calling. Who, any prior service military here? What branch? Marine Corps. Ugh, any army guys? Seriously, make it up, just say you're in the army. Yes. In the Army? Yeah. Okay, good. No, I'm just teasing. I, Marines, are all, they're all right. 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 I won't get into that because this is being recorded. Come to the next show. When's the next show? Tomorrow at 6 p.m. Yeah, tomorrow night or something like that. And we'll go the uh, unfiltered version. Yes? How many applicants? Applicants? So we'll do two processes, and we're right around that. We'll get around the 95 to 100 apply. And we'll shovel it down after the physical agility, actually the pro application process, the physical agility and the written exam, which are standard across the board. Um, it's not, we don't make it up. It's, what the, it's the same standard that you guys do if you're in the police academy. Uh, you have to test in and you have to test out phys for physical agility. And then the written is a nationally standardized test. You get that down and it usually between 35 and 40. So 
People say, oh, recruitment and retention is so hard. No one wants to do this job. And they're right to a point. Oh, sorry. That was uh, the shoe team email. That was a different buzzer on my fancy watch here. Um, so the, um, we don't worry about quantity when it comes to numbers applying. I'm sorry, we don't worry about quantity. We, worry, we just want quanti quality officers. So for example, if all we have is four openings, if I get four good people, I'm fine with that. If one out of the four fail because they can't, um, uh, I, for, I don't want to use the, the, the actual technical, if they can't com comply to Waukesha Police Department standards, conform uh, to the standards, then we let them go. But that's, it's, that's on the person. Uh, we put a ton of money. We have a ton of money that we use for training. Waukesha is known, City Waukesha is known in the, not only in this area, but also in the state as being the highly trained. Uh, our former Chief Russ Jack, if you guys do go to the academy, you know, you'll see him down there. And our current Deputy Chief Dennis Angle, actually we're one of two, guy, or two of like eight or 10 guys that wrote the use of force manual. So if you open the manual, you'll see it. Those, there, I mean, that's awesome to have somebody like that in your agency that are experts in the use of force because then our training is gauged toward that. Our training is not just um, nuclear to what the state requires us every 24 hours, but we train um, 80 plus hours um, a year. Um, and that's not even including shooting. We shoot every other month just because we want our people to shoot. We don't shoot just annually. So there's a lot of training that you get just as a patrol officer. Then you get into all your specialty units and you get trained even more. So you can raise your hand. Okay, just stretching one. All right, good. So I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not asking a question. I'm just making you think. So why get into law enforcement? If you guys know that you're going to be judged, if I walk around, you want this on me, right? All right. If anybody has any good, I'm going to do it. Can I do it right now? Well, I'll be on tape. I can. So if, and I got some goodies here. I take my glasses off because then these things get fogged up. And I hate standing in one position because it makes you uncomfortable, right? You think that I'm talking to you the whole time when in reality I'm talking to everybody. So if I run into something, it's because I can't see. But so what are you doing to prepare yourself for law enforcement? It's a shameless plug. I do own a security company. It's called Elite Protection Specialist, as you can see here on my face. I have a couple masks. If those that are wearing paper ones or would like to have one, I have some up there for you. If you're interested in working in the security field, that's and getting interested in law enforcement, and you want to have that stop gap of something to do to prepare you, is join a security company. Join a community service as a community service officer for your local police department. Become a reserve officer. Uh, become, well, they have the police reserves and then they also have, and you guys, everybody's over 18, right? You have to be pretty much to be here, okay. Um, then the Explore program wouldn't be for y'all. But is join something like that. Why do I, why do I have an interest in security? Not, and it's not because I own a, a company, it's because that is the easiest way and stemming from, what was it, Marcus, Michael, the DNR dude? Marcus? So what Marcus was saying at the end of there is exactly right. These tools, he had more gadgets on his belt than, he, uh, than I would carry. Uh, old age, your back starts to hurt after a while and stuff like that. So I toned her down a little bit on carrying all that cool stuff. Um, is your mouth, absolutely, absolutely will get you in trouble. Tell me when, hold the beep, when can you tell, call somebody a fucking idiot? Never. Never, right? Especially if it's being taped. You can never, ever say that. But in rage, in the heat of the moment, whatever comes out of your mouth, it's like the little kids when they drop something, they go, Shh. and it's like, where'd they hear that word from? Well, of course, it's mom and dad, I must have said it, but they said it in the right context. In the heat of the moment, with all that emotion going, you drop that, right? How can you walk that back, especially if it's on video? That will get you in trouble, or it escalates the situation. Right? The way you look at somebody, right? I can look at you and you can and be like, <sighs> here, <sighs> how interested do I look in your conversation, you talking to me right now, right? Not that interested. Yeah. And what? Uh huh. You're really like, what? This guy's a douche, right? That will get you in trouble. How do you talk yourself out of situations? 
when you see somebody in crisis and they're going to maybe t armed with a gun or a knife, or they're going to do something that's going to hurt somebody else, how do you talk to them? You look at them. Hey, what's your name? Mariah. 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 Hey, Mariah, I'm Dan, right? What's going on? We're going to be all right. We're going to be reassuring. We're going to show compassion. We're going to humanize myself. Mariah, I have a beautiful girl that's, my daughter's 15 years old too. She has suffered, blah, blah, blah. Whatever it may be, how can I connect with that person? How can my mouth, how can my words and my mind, right? At all, not once did I pull out a tool that Marcus had. Did the trooper have a cool duty belt? Was his all shiny and stuff like that too? He did, did he have like the core frame stuff or did he have, no? He looked like a trooper trooper? Okay, good. Sometimes they have shiny boots and everything like that. So is creating the dialogue with you. Maybe getting down on a knee. Hey, what's, you know, is showing that, that those words get you out of trouble as much as they can get you in the trouble. Why do I say that? It's because how do you train yourself to do that, right? I think there's some guy, go Google it, 30 day challenge. I think it's called, a, it's a TED talk. It's a few minutes long. Um, it's about this guy who was afraid of rejection, right? He was afraid of rejection. So what did he do? For every day for 30 days, he'd walk up to somebody, can I have $100? No, I'm really asking, can I have $100? Okay, he was afraid to say it. So then he would go, hey, can I have $100? No. Okay, and he'd walk away. Can I have $100? And finally somebody said to him, what do you want to, he did that for 30 days, right? Another one was, he, uh, can I borrow this? Oh, no, anybody got to Here, perfect. Let's just say this is a, a bag of fries. Oh, you still got some in here. So let's say this is a bag of fries from uh, Five Guys. Hey, these fries are so good. Can I get a refill? Right? So he would go into situations knowing that it would be an outlandish request and he would do it. My thing is, if you guys are uncomfortable talking to people in this classroom that you've been dealing with for, I don't know, how long have you been... I mean, if it's more than a day, you shouldn't be able to say hi to somebody in the hallway, right? Is that if you're going to be able, if you have a fear of public speaking, that's all right. If you have the fear of engaging somebody in some difficult conversations, like, hey, where did this guy touch you? Did it make you feel uncomfortable? You're looking for elements of a crime. You're going to have to say some graphic, intimate parts of the body. Once out of the police academy, you'll probably know all seven intimate parts that are defined by statute. It's recorded, so we won't talk about them, but I think you guys can gauge what, you, what, what we're talking about here. If you have a problem or a fear of saying things like that, those are things you may want to practice, not necessarily going up to somebody and asking them about the impotent parts. I'm saying more or less walking up to somebody and having a conversation with them that is not going to be fun for you because that's what's going to help you get to it. Again, a shameless plug for a uh, security field, but it may be. I mean, WCTCC has part-time dispatchers, right? There's dispatch centers for hospitals. There's dispatch centers for, I mean, going to customer service. I'm talking Verizon, U.S. Cellular, any business that has a customer service, go out and customer service. I talk to you all the supervisors at a dispatch center would tell you they want their, their dispatchers are customer servants. They're going to answer the phone and listen to somebody that's in crisis. How many times did somebody call 911 and said they had a great day? How many times did they say, hey, call 911, my kid got straight A's on the report card? None. Says, my wife made me amazing breakfast. You should see this shit. None. None, right? Point being is no one calls 911 or the police to tell us how great of a day you have. That phone rings. Dispatchers know something's, something is bound to happen. We hope that it's like, when's the parade? When does my garbage go out? I mean, that's why we have social media and websites now. But those are questions that you guys know that going into this job, you're going to be judged by the court of public opinion, regardless if it's Monday morning quarterback or within 30 seconds of you guys taking action. And it's going to be projected all over the new, all over the world in, with the click of a button, right? You guys are used to that. I'm not used to that. You guys are used to, I don't know, you guys go on, I don't know, do you go on dates on? I mean, how do you guys, you don't know? I wouldn't know. You don't date? <laughs> No? All right. Is it a lie? Yeah. Oh. So why would you lie to me? You're lying? That's all right. You can lie. 
I can tell in your eyes anyways. You're shaking like a leaf. You know, we can talk about it. You have your nonverbals are telling, even with a mask on. See, look at your eyes. Your eyes are flicking a little. I'm just making fun of you. Now, now I'm making fun of you now. Just get you, embarrass you a little bit. But is going to something, do something now. Do something uh, before you guys actually get yourself into a position where you're going to be going to law enforcement to be exposed to it in some fashion. Go into something that you know is not a fun job. Uh, working at a, a, a flower shop or working for a landscaping company where all you're going to do is cut grass, that's not going to... It's not going to really help you. It may help your work ethic, but it's not going to help you so much as to be dealing with people. And that's, that's like the biggest thing um, that you guys got to figure out now to be able to walk into a job and be able to talk to anybody about anything, even if you don't know anything about it, right? It's one of those know what you don't know and kind of BS your way out of a lot of things because that's the only way that you're, you're going to uh, save face. Um, and do well. I love my job. As stressed as it is, as harsh as it is, as the PIO for the police department, putting something out on, on Facebook, giving a media story, doing an interview, digital media, print media, televised media, social media, whatever media outlets they are to get a story into the public domain, is um, it's an awesome opportunity because I feel like I'm a great brand ambassador to the police department. How we're reading about what people then twist your words or create their own narrative really sucks. It really sucks uh, out there. But again, that's not my job. My job is to allow the community of the citizens of Waukesha, our community members, to feel safe. How do we make them feel safe? We listen to them. We engage them. We have neighborhood engagement officers that go out and talk to the community members. What are their needs of that specific neighborhood? What are the needs of that side of the town? What are their needs what, and their concerns that we can address, right? Instead of being re reactive on those fronts. And I believe we do a good job about that. We have a great community support. I'm knocking on wood here. We haven't had a ton of protests. We have community support. We have probably two or three officer involved shootings annually. We, and we run about two or three homicides a year. So we're not that, we're not Milwaukee. Um, and we're not uh, some of the other communities, but we do get our uh, activity and our community is very supportive of us, but that's the hard work that it takes for somebody to do that. Let your ego down, right? Um, don't go into a situation thinking that you know everything uh, and, th and these people are just, you know, whatever. They're just trash, you know. I used to think any heroin users were, and they're passed out, and it's like, okay, we just did Narcan this guy three times this week. What are we going to do? He's not a junkie. He's still a human being. He's still a human being that needs the love. He's still a human being that needs compassion. He still needs, he's still a human being, and I'm not being gender specific here, that person is still a person that needs the love and care and compassion that we have to give to them, right? And it's hard. It is hard. It is hard day after day. The, the, the accumulated trauma that one goes through is amazing. It is amazing what you guys will take in and take in and take in. That's why you see wellness is such a big, big topic going on in law enforcement right now. The wellness component. What are people doing? It's our job. I look at Waukesha for many years as a train, 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 train. We can shoot, move, and communicate and do super amazing things. But how do we get an officer to retirement? We train them. How do we get them to and through retirement mentally, right? That's been a big focus over the last about six, seven years now is that we're really doing, right? What happens when, where are my athletes out there? I mean, you're a Marine, so you, you're a Marine, you're, I mean, you're an athlete, okay? You hurt your shoulder, right? Tear your rotator cuff, where do you go? Doctor, right? What's the doctor do? Right, after surgery, what do we do? We do this thing called? Rehabilitation. And you see a physical therapist and you go on rehab for six to eight weeks, right? And then you come back and you're in full swing, right? To go back and play softball or basketball or whatever sport you want to play. What happens when you see a very traumatic incident right in front of you? Dead baby. Run over by a truck. You can't unsee that, right? Do you think your brain can process that? Did it make you maybe lose sleep at night? 
Does it maybe give you night terrors? Does it, does it mess with your head a little bit? Who's got the courage to go to the person to their left or right and saying, that, that really screwed my mind up. That really screwed me up. I'm not doing well. I can't, see, I can't unsee that baby's picture. Every night at 3 o'clock I wake up in the morning and I see that picture. Who's got the courage to go talk to somebody about that? I can tell you my generation, not many people. The generation before me, you were weak. You were a coward. Suck it up. Toughen up. Don't be a baby. Quit being a wuss. Everybody's got to do that. That's 20, 30 years ago. That generation, drinking, out of shape, coping mechanisms that would not be uh, what one would think are healthy in today's age. My generation, it's starting to shift. Biggest thing I do at Waukesha is wellness. My phone will ring at 2, 3 in the morning for people in crisis, officers that need help. I will drop everything for that person and get them help. It's been, and I don't even need to explain to prove to you the why because a lot of it is very private and confidential. But I'm a captain and have, a, have an officer come up to me knowing they're in an extremely safe environment and they, they know that we'll get them help. Without a doubt, that's our job. How do we get them through retirement? How do we... How do we help? Who helps us <laughs> helping people? Who helps, I think the saying is, who helps those who help others, right? We do. Are you ready? Are you mentally ready to be able to go, ooh, I need some help after a shooting? Officers, we get involved with shootings. How are you doing? Great, fine. <laughs> ooh, yeah. Good. Don't worry about me. It's tough. I'm good. No the time off. I'm good. Good. Ah. Go check on so-and-so. They need it. Not week later. Oh, I, I can't do this. I, oh my God! Replaying the events, they start ruminating. They start seeing things over and over. And it's like, no, you're fine. What you'll always hear me say is, guess what? You're having a normal reaction to an abnormal event, right? No one expects somebody to walk through that door and start shooting a classroom. Nobody expects. How many people expect a drunk guy coming? Who expects somebody with dementia coming in and just sawing off at the mouth, right? We don't expect that, right? Granted, it's not gonna be a critical event. Granted, it may not be bring a safety issue to us, but we're all gonna have a reaction to it in some way, shape, or form. On critical incidents, when you involve into somebody dying, when you involve into yourself using force, when you involve to a high stress situation, you're gonna have a normal reaction for a normal event. It's normal. People think it's weird. There are people to this day and age, and your generation is, is gonna start to fix that just by what we, this generation does. And that is, you're gonna say, raise your hand and say, I need a hand. You're gonna say, I need help. The other word that you would come, if you would come up to me right now and say, hey, messing with my head, I need, a, I need some help. I'm gonna go, what's your name? Emily. Emily, I'm gonna say, em do I know you, Emily? No. Okay, good, because you gave me. So, Emily, you're the most courageous person I know right now. I'm so proud of you. I thank you so much for allowing me to help you out now. How do you want to go about this? What do you need from us? Right? Because there's providers out there that are going to help. There's inpatient, there's outpatient, there's substance, there's addiction. We, there's many, many providers out there that will help us out. The hardest part is what? Asking for help. It's the hardest part which is why it's the most courageous part. Once you go open that door and you say, I need help, man, it will feel like the weight is completely lifted off your shoulders. You will be able to walk through the door and all your problems will still be there except you have somebody walking your road with you now. And that's what it's for. All too often, we forgot about that. All too often, taking a sick day or a mental health day was wrong. Now... We do wellness visits. We do wellness checks. We mandate our sensitive crimes unit who deals with all the sick pedophiles out there that touch kids inappropriately and do things to babies that would make your stomach vomit. Our criminal forensic unit, the guys who download or take away all of the pornography and all that little crazy sick shit that people do 
take it off their thing, they analyze it, and they prepare it for court. When you see so-and-so in the paper, you know, Billy Bob got arrested, 10 counts of child pornography, times that each count by at least 100 to 1,000. The DA's office only wants 10 counts. But there are thousands, terabytes, you guys know what that is more than I do, terabytes full of data on pedophiles. That messes with them. We make them go to a wellness visit. Sit down with a psychologist, a therapist, a social worker of their like, of their choice. We pay for it, and they do check-ins quarterly. Ultimately, I would like to have that be done by our entire agency, including dispatchers, including clerical. I, walked, I did a walkout interview with one of our clerks one time, 60-year-old lady. I always thought um, she was like a mother figure, just a sweet lady. And I said, I, she's like, I'm going to miss the people. I'm like, well, what would you, is it all the bullshit that came along with the job and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no. It's like the thing that I'll never miss is understanding what you guys had to go through. I only had to type it because we dictate our reports. It's like talking to text, except the texting part is done by a human being is I had to write those stories, and I thought they were sick. You guys actually had to live it and see it and observe it and document it. That's why you're seeing a big wellness push. Why do I want to kind of bring that in as, as we're ending up here, is that everyone's going to be all right, that this is a high-stress job. Depending on where you go, SID in Milwaukee, uh, my buddy is the captain there. Um, uh, I don't know, they'll probably start transferring more people with the new chief, I don't know how that works. But you go to a high volume agency, to a Lake Country agency out in this area, to another state, doesn't matter, it's the, typically the same issues. It may be magnified in the inner city versus the, the suburbs, but there's gonna be the same issues. There's gonna be the internal politics of people jockeying wanting to get promotion, wanting to take a specialty assignment, trying to get on the SWAT team or be a detective or being in evidence or being canine or being SWAT or whatever the specialty unit that may be that agency has, there's gonna be the internal rift. Because guess what? If there's one position, five people doing it, there's four people filing hurt feelings reports, right? Sure. A couple of people are gonna be, you got that one from the Army, right? You're the only one. Right? The, the law police, not the feelings police. Yes. Is, so, there's going to be internal politics on any agency. There's going to be your external stressors out in the field, taking the calls for service. But you got to know that there's peer support, there's critical stress, incident stress management teams that are becoming more prevalent in agencies. There's wellness checks that's coming more in agencies. So there's a lot of things out there that I would say, yes, are you entering an age in law enforcement that I never was exposed to until after 20 years. And I was able to have a good um, foundation of how to handle those situations. You guys are coming into something way more technical than I did. However, you're also getting a lot more support. We're understanding more about how you guys deal with things, what we needed to support you, how do we get you to and through that 30 year career, okay? Shameless plug for finances. Once you get into law enforcement, how many people have student loans? Oh, good. That's good. You guys are trying to work your way through it, or you get the GI money. Are you using all your GI money? Yeah. Hell yeah, I got my bachelor's and master's degree and pay a dime. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I took full advantage of that. If anybody else has opportunities with grants or anything, use them, use them, use them. Don't get that. When you get into law enforcement, especially if you get into a, a system where they have WRS, Milwaukee's on its own pension system. Uh, Milwaukee County's on their own pension system. Some agencies are on their own pension system. But if you get in the re Wisconsin retirement system, that's something that your municipality will contribute to. You may have to contribute a little bit to it. But then they're going to offer like a 457 plan or a 401k plan or some type of an, a deferred compensation plan. Where it's, take full advantage of that because you're not used to having the money. If you get a $50,000 check, and most of you start an agency, will be more than 50 grand. If you get a $50,000 check, right, and you get, uh, I don't know, 1,500 bucks, and maxing on deferred comp, 500 bucks, do it as best as you can, or put away as much money as you can, because you're not used to having that money. 
It will take away so many stress, fears, worries, and anxieties when you get in your 40s and 50s and go, oh shit, I have to find another job because I have to retire from this one because I can't take this police job anymore or I want to get out of the police job and I have to do something else to sustain my living. Save, 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 save as much as you can now. We beat it into our new officers because you're not used to that check. I hate it when I see the new officer come on. First day after probation, they got a 157 inch TV with a brand new pickup truck that's lifted up to here that they're clearly not going to use once they get married and have kids because you can't fit in babies in there you know mama can't put the thing into the car you know don't do any of that stupid stuff you know go buy a jet ski or a boat or something that the family can use or that you're going to get some long-term stuff out of that so i'll open it up here for we got seven minutes if not we'll we'll end a little early if you have any questions uh throw away Go ahead. What does your security company involve security we do asset protection guard force uh dignitary protection in the milwaukee and waukesha area so um, uh, an example, we do a lot, well, we were, we were doing a lot of schools, churches, uh, places of worship, and then the COVID hit, but now we're doing a lot of COVID sites. So our business dropped, I got scared, and then it picked back up again. So basically, Urban Air in Waukesha, it's a, it's a new little, like, uh, adult bounce house type uh, ninja warrior, uh, one of them things. Um, we do security there, we do security um, a lot of at schools and churches. We do terminations. Um, there's armed gigs, there's unarmed gigs. Naturally, the armed gigs go to the law enforcement guys. So if you go on EliteProtection.org, you can uh, go to that for your, uh, um, uh, the website and they can direct you how to apply and stuff like that. Yeah, yes. Uh, we just picked up St. John's, uh, well it's not, it's called St. John's Northwestern Military Game, but now it's just St. John's. I think St. John's Academy, because they're doing a leadership program and they're doing a regular, so they're trying to get away from the military thing, but that's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 10 at night till 10 in the morning. So some of it's night shift hours, some of it's during the day. Um, we're doing Pence at The Rock last week. We got, um, you know, there's all, things pop up. So the nice thing about us is you sign up for what you want to work, we don't schedule you. We throw out an email and say, hey, what do you want to do? Um, well, you can cut this off now because I don't know when this is going to be used next time. This is just a cheap plug. Um, so, yeah, we'll talk more afterwards. I forgot that this is on. Video. Video, yeah, you're supposed to remind me that. What else you guys got? Go ahead. What do you see as a benefit to have like, your own dispensary compared to being at a consolidated center? We'll talk after about that. I don't want to influence anybody else's mind about my personal opinion. Because it's a, it's a budget issue, it's a whole bunch of different issues. I like our consolidated PSAP. I mean, I like our single PSAP. So. What else? Nothing? You want them to leave or you want them to stay an extra five minutes? Yeah. 